last couple of weeks, we've been talking about bread. And I'm sure those of my gluten-free friends are kind of like, can we be done talking about bread already? You know, we have donuts out there today. You know, it just keeps up the bread thing. I might not have bread here on the podium, but you've got it out there in donuts, which I keep smelling but cannot have. So I'm trying to not do it, but it's a fun thing. We want to celebrate dads today. So this bread is really an important theme um, in scripture. And we see it kind of to represent God's provision at times in scripture and also even God's presence. And so as we look at this, especially with bread, we're looking at the, what Jesus did with bread when he had it. And so each time he did, he, had it, he did three things with the bread. He blessed it, he broke it, and then he gave it away. And so we're gonna, as we've been looking at this, we talked about in the first week about how God blesses us, right? So our hands in the lives of Jesus, that he blesses us, he calls us his own, he um, speaks well of us. And then last week we talked about the idea of even our brokenness can actually be a really restorative thing where God uses our brokenness and we see it to serve others and we see it in a way that God can use. So last week, David kind of helped us recognize here that what is broken in Jesus' hands doesn't disappear it multiplies. And it multiplies not just for our benefit, but for the benefit of other people to be shared and given away. So today we're actually gonna look at the idea of being given and what does that look like and why it's important because God's designed us that way. We're not meant to just live life about ourselves. We're meant to be given to other people. So we're gonna talk about your favorite gift. Can you think about your favorite gift that you've ever been given, or received from someone? Maybe it's a really big thing, like one of those, we're going to Disneyland type of gift surprises and you find out that you're getting on a plane the next day. Or some people, I know this has happened, I heard somebody tell me once, you go outside and there's a car with a big red bow on it, a new car kind of gift. I don't know, has anyone had that ever? I actually had somebody tell me they actually had a big red bow on the car because I thought that only happens at Christmas in the commercials. Like who really does that? But I guess somebody somewhere. But it's just, you know, these fun big things that we talk about. And maybe a gift that's been meaningful or impactful to you, it was maybe just something as simple as a hand-drawn card from your grandkids. Or maybe something I've experienced is one of those cards that you get from your young adult children that you actually, they're thanking you and saying, I appreciate the sacrifices you made and I now understand. Maybe they have kids of their own and they're saying, I understand what you gave and what it took to, to take care of me and love me. Those kind of cards that mean a whole lot when you realize that thankfulness and gratefulness from kids. You know, maybe it's just something simple like a friend coming, bringing flowers from the yard and saying, um, just wanted to say hi, thinking about you because you might've been down in that moment. So it kind of was meaningful or impactful. You know, psychologists actually tell us that it's not the big grandiose gifts that actually mean the most in our lives, the most meaningful and impactful for us. It's really sometimes the small things. So when we're talking about being given, we're not talking about these big grandiose things, but it's just the simple gestures that we can do in our lives and the, and the connections that we make with people. I remember um, when we first went to New York in 2007, upstate New York, very cold, and I was struggling as we went um, to sleep at night, like to fall asleep, because I was always so cold. And so Gareth, I think it was the first or second Christmas that we were there, he bought me a, this is important, the size of it, a twin size heated blanket for me to go to sleep with. And I know that sounds funny, but he, he does not want that heat on his side of the bed. It was just under the comforter on my side of the bed. But it honestly was, I still hold it as one of my favorite gifts for my husband because it meant so much that I get to get under that, you know, cozy, cozy, warm blanket at night to try to go to sleep in super cold upstate New York. So I just really appreciated that. You think about those gifts. It's not always the big things. It's sometimes just the very thoughtful or meaningful ways that we can, can love each other. So interesting when you think of gifts that way. The stuff we remember the most sometimes are the, the little things, but it was the most meaningful at the time. So we're gonna talk about what it is designed. We're we're designed to be given and what does that look like? And we're gonna actually jump back into the story of the feeding of the 5,000 that David kind of went over last week. We're gonna take a look at that and read that in Luke 9, 12 through 17. It says, in the afternoon, the 12 came to him and said, send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place here. And he replied, you give them something to eat. And they answered, we only have, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all the crowd. About 5,000 men were there. But he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. 
The disciples did so, and everyone sat down. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, he gave thanks, and he broke it. And then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. And they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Now, I know we've maybe heard this story before. We think, okay, there's 5,000 people. God did this miracle. It's amazing. But I just want you for a moment to put yourself in the place of the disciples. To tell you the truth, we don't even know how many women or children are there. So there's probably a little bit more like 10,000 people at that time when they were counting. They just counted the men that particular day. But um, they had a, a lot to organize in that. And the disciples are like, we don't have anything. Let's figure this out. There's no food trucks nearby that people can go to. They need to go to a town before they all get hanged and we can't handle them anymore at that time after Jesus speaking all day. So you think of it, they're kind of in mode of like, I gotta organize this. I gotta figure out the best next step for them. And Jesus says, why don't you give them something to eat? And they're thinking, we don't have anything. what, What could we possibly give? You know, so he's saying, you give them something to eat. And he's saying, he's probably really at this point, really challenging them to say, think beyond yourself. What can we do in this particular situation? And I think at times, just like the disciples, we kind of have a tendency as humans to kind of have the scarcity mentality, right? Like, I don't, I don't have anything to give. What could I possibly give to these, to these people? Or how do, I, how do I feed all of these people, right? Or we think, I'm a nobody. What could I give? What could I do? But oftentimes... I think sometimes you might look at somebody and think, oh, they're, they're so selfish. They're not willing to give or to serve or to help other people. But I think a lot of times in our hearts, if we think deep down, it's really insecurity. Sometimes it's things in us to say, are we, am I struggling with the fact that I don't have what it takes? Or we kind of listen to this lie or this version of this lie of saying, I'm not enough. What could I possibly give? So instead we just kind of go back within ourselves and think I can't give anything. So sometimes you might think it's out of selfishness, but I think sometimes there's insecurity in us in those situations. And when we see that, what we see in this story is that these disciples, they gave it to Jesus, right? He took what they had, which was just the five loaves and two fish, really small. And he gives it, he you know, blesses it and breaks it, give thanks for it, gives it back to them. And then they give it away. And it's only as they began giving away and doing their part in God's story in this moment is that's when the miracle happens. That's when people, all of a sudden, the baskets are getting fuller and fuller of bread. You see, we, we can, God can take what we already have in our hands. It's not some miracle that we have to make happen. God uses what we have. And he's the one that can multiply it and bring the miracle in that. And I, I love seeing kind of the difference in the disciples when we get to Acts 3 after Jesus has already ascended to heaven. Um, Peter and John are walking and they see this lame man. A lame man is begging, you know, and, and Peter says, he looks at him, actually looks at him intently in the eye and he says to him in Acts 3, he goes, I don't have any gold or silver. So you're kind of hearing the same, like, I don't have any of that. But Peter and John, who are two disciples that have experienced being with Jesus, they've experienced his love, they've experienced the filling of the Holy Spirit, and they now have that power in them that raised Christ from the dead, which is the same power that we have in us today. And so what Peter looks at this man intently in the eye and he says to him, I don't have gold or silver, but I'll give you what I have. And that is Jesus. And he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, rise up and walk. So this man, this lame man that thought he just was gonna try to get some gold or silver to get him through that day, actually got a lot more than he bargained for. There was a power involved. And Peter says, here's what I do have. So I think the disciples have kind of learned this through as we went through their story. So in Christ, our life, which we think sometimes we have very little to offer, actually God can use it and do a lot out of it. As followers of Jesus, we give our life away. That's just the way we were designed. It's a very part of who God made us to be. We're called to a life of givenness. Like your story and even the hard parts of your story are meant to be given in a way to serve others. And if God's designed us, right, for sharing and for giving of ourselves, if we're designed to be given, you think of this as a follower of Jesus, we do this first as our love for Jesus. That's, the, that's where it starts. That's the motivation. It's not that I have to do all these things and check off a box, but it says, guess what? I am part of the body of Christ. And because Jesus' life flows through me, it also can flow through me to other people. So it comes to me and I have the blessings of what it means to live as his, as his son or daughter, but it also means it goes through us. And this also isn't just all the good parts of us, the parts that look pretty on the outside and the parts that, oh, I'm really gifted in this so I can serve and give to other people 
people in this, but it's also the parts that are broken in our, in our lives. Remember, it's in our weakness, he's made strong. I love that. I go back to that all the time, remembering it's only in my weakness that God comes and brings his strength. I was thinking about, particularly on a Father's Day today, a friend of mine who was actually an orphan and he grew up in the foster care system and he had a really rough and broken childhood. And by the time um, he got married, he got, he got saved later in life. And he remember thinking, how am I ever gonna be a dad? I don't know how to do it. I have not seen a good example of this at all. I just have all this brokenness from my past. And he just asked God to help him and to just pour out his love upon him so that he could pour his love into his kids. And that's exactly what God did. He came and just, um, he gave him, he has four kids and I love watching just his heart with his own kids. But beyond that, God then gave him a passion for other children. So he is actually a children's pastor today. He is this man who had no understanding of what it was like to even have loving adults in his life, wanted so deeply, had such a passion to pour out love to kids and for them to know Jesus. And I just love watching him because he's got the biggest smile on his face all the time and he's with the kids and he's Pastor Craig to them and they just love that so much. And I just love to see how he took something that was broken and God made it beautiful and began to now show it to another generation. It's awesome to see. I also think of the brokenness, those times in our life, um, Carlos and Yesel, who have little Haley, who we've been praying for, that had her heart surgery in, back in February. Um, she was actually here at Second Service a couple weeks back, as you were here and kind of got to see her. Um, but just as they were going through the struggle of really difficult recovery in Boston, where she had her surgery in February, and yet I keep hearing, they're telling me like, we got to pray with some other families and, and Carlos is talking to them about Jesus. And so you've got other families with sick kids going through it and where they could have been at a time where it was all about them and they just needed to have the prayer and the support, they were reaching out to other families too. In the brokenness, right? Even in the hard times and the struggles, God uses, uses us to minister to other people. And in John 21, after Jesus' resurrection, he appears kind of again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. And so they had gone back to like what they had known. So Jesus had come, he had died. And, and what they did is they thought, oh, let's we'll go back to fishing. That's what we did before. That's what we'll do again. And Jesus comes and performs this miracle and, and brings some, some fish into their nets as they're out fishing. And as they realize it's him. And so then they, they come in and they end up having breakfast with Jesus, with this fish that they had caught. And Jesus has this amazing um, conversation exchange with Peter and it's in John 21, 15 through 17. And it says, after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know, I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know, I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. You see, it's a love of Jesus that motivates us to care for others and to serve people and to give of ourselves. He says, if you love me, then feed my sheep. But Peter, you see, had actually denied Jesus three times before, just a couple weeks before this. And what this is, is this beautiful restoring kind of conversation that Jesus has with Peter to ask him three times, do you love me? And he says, then feed my sheep. He says, it doesn't just stop with me and Jesus. Do you love me, Peter? Okay, then we're good. It's you and me. He says, then this is the next outworking, then feed my sheep. See, the life that loves Jesus always finds its way to serve other people. It just comes out of it. It doesn't do it out of duty. It does it out of a response to Jesus. You know, at times I've struggled with making the serving and the calling and, and be doing ministry the thing more than Jesus. And there's times where I've, God's had to call me on this and say, am I thinking, oh God, look what I'm doing for you. I'm just, you know, adding more, you know, gold stars to my chart as I get ready to go to heaven because you look at all the things I'm doing for you. And it stops being about Jesus and it starts being about the serving and just, oh, I'm doing all these right things. But Jesus is saying, this is where it starts. It starts with our love response to who he is and all the love that he gave to us first and foremost. 
You know, I, I know it's easy to hear a sermon that talks about giving or serving or giving ourselves to something and just say, oh, okay, I got it. Oh man, I got to try more. Now I feel guilty. How am I going to do this? What's the next step? Do I, oh, I've got to do this. I got to change this. But I don't want you to hear it that way. It all starts with Jesus and his love for us. And so as we love him back in return, it just is an outworking of that in our lives. And we're always maturing, right? We have to to work at that. It's like God's working in us through that. We continue to mature in that way. In uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 6.19, it tells us that you do, we do not belong to yourself for God bought you with a high price. You know, this line that my life is not my own is not something that's always the most exciting thing to hear, the most popular thing we hear sometimes in Christianity. We all wanna hear God loves us, but there's also this response that we have, that our life isn't our own, that when he comes in, he's not just saving us, he becomes Lord of our lives and what that looks like. Sometimes it's easy to just get a little focused in on myself and my kids and that's about all I can handle. I can't take on anything else. And, but God's saying, your life is so much bigger than that. And there's a whole, whether it's a community here at church or a world at large around us that needs us to serve. The other thing that we come, the motivation we start with for our love for Jesus, but it's also for the sake of others and other people. When we look at the birth of the early church and what they did together in Acts 2, they shared all things and they cared for one another and they met even daily at times. I, I don't know if I can imagine kind of meeting here daily and doing like a church thing, but that's how it worked in their, in their culture at the time. And I love in, in 1 John three seventeen it says, if someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need, but shows no compassion. How can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth. So we will be confident when we stand before God. It's our actions is what comes out of the love that we have. And I I love this quote by Amy Carmichael, who was an Irish missionary um, to India for over 50 years. She said it this way, you can give without loving but you cannot love without giving. Giving just comes out of a heart that loves. It's easy to say, oh, I'll give and I'm gonna check the box that I did that and now I feel good about myself for the day. But there's a different place when it's out of the love that God puts in our hearts because of who he is. We see all kinds of these instructions throughout the Old and the New Testament about caring and serving and taking care of people. I think of um, in the early church, There's a church at Carthage, which is modern day Tunisia now. Um, And they had been persecuted throughout that first, you know, 250 years. And and so the time was coming when persecution was actually coming down a little bit. And, but yet the church itself kind of was dealing with this issue of unity. So we had a reason where we had some people um, were faithful to God and said, I'm not gonna serve the gods that the emperor was telling them to serve. They were told you have to serve their sacrifice to these gods. And you would even have to sign something to say that you sacrifice to these gods. So that was the culture of the day. And for the Christians, a lot of them said, we're not gonna do that. And they suffered for it. Sometimes their neighbors would turn them into the authorities and they would even and gloat about it and say, I turned in a Christian, I caught another one, you know, not sacrificing to these gods. So there was a lot of suffering that happened in the church. But there were also people in the church that wanted to follow God and they were trying to do their best to do that, but they kind of took the easy way out. And at times they said, well, I'll just sacrifice to the God. And, and they would sign the document to saying that they did it. So you can imagine that'd be pretty hard if you're the faithful ones that had gone through and been suffering throughout this time. And all of a sudden you've got these people next to you in church, these other Christians that had had this last in their faith and kind of just took the easy way out and saying, I'm gonna worship next to them. We're gonna do this together. So you could see how there could be a little bit of rubbing the wrong way between the two of them. And then you also had all these pagan neighbors that were you know, sacrificing to their idols and turning the Christians in. So it was a big struggle. And what comes in two, the year 251 in the city of Carthage is um, a plague comes and hits the city. And it came so, so badly and the people that would get infected, what they would actually do is take people out in the streets, leave them in the streets completely unattended because they didn't wanna get infected. Because if I get sick or even try to care for them, it means I'm gonna get sick now. And so you can, can you just imagine the pitiful nature of seeing these people in the streets and they're not dead yet, they haven't died, but they're just begging for water or anything to be helped. And a lot of the city actually ended up leaving. If you were healthy, you just left the city. So these people are left there 
to die. And so the bishop of Carthage named Bishop Cyprian, he called for the special meeting of the Christians. And he said to them, we need to respond in a way that's marked by courage and patience to our fellow Christians and to those in our city. And so he calls them together. And these Christians not only served their own Christians that were the people that they had been faithful with, but they served the the Christians that had kind of walked away and kind of stepped away from it and and sacrificed to the other gods. And not only that, they went into the city and cared for, at the sake of their own lives, cared for those that had even maybe neighbors that had turned them in and had been so horrible to them. You see, this church in Carthage had experienced the love and the communion of Christ in um, the table, in the breaking of the bread. They had done this quite often and always remembered the love that God had for them. And as they came together, they realized as they broke the bread that their lives were meant to be given the same way. This is what God had designed them for. So when this moment in the city of Carthage happened, they were ready for it. They were ready to give their lives as like broken bread, to give their lives to save others. This kind of radical hospitality It really happens when Christians are see and we realize and experience God's blessing in our lives, that we accept and receive the healing for our brokenness, and then we allow God to use those things, the good things, but also that broken area. I think sometimes when we speak out of our brokenness and those things that happen in our lives, it touches somebody more than sounding like we've got it all together, you know, as we talk with them. So following Jesus is a call of selflessness, In uh, Hebrews 13, 16, it says, and don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. We wanna be a people that there is a sacrifice to pay in Christianity. There is a cross that we bear and walk with each day in the world. And God's saying, I've called you to this. I've designed you to be given for other people. And the another way that we look is not just that it's our love for Jesus and for the sake of other people, but also for the love of the world. This is what Jesus was about. In John 6, 51, he said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. See, Jesus is our master, right? He's our example. As disciples, we wanna follow in his in his. Um, as his example for us. So what does it look like if we were to live in a way that we didn't just share our lives only with those that we love, maybe our own family or those, maybe those few people at church that I might know wanna love and help them, but what would it look like in a culture like ours today? If you think about our culture and Christianity, sometimes Christianity isn't very welcome in 2023 America. Sometimes it seemed, it's seen as even harmful to people or maybe really out of touch and we just don't get it. Maybe sometimes we're only seen as the people that don't like certain things compared to those that wanna serve. But I love um, when you think about gospel hospitality or generosity, what we kind of been learning about with the early church and how they were with one another, that God's saying, what would it look like for us to be that way now? I love this quote um, by Glenn Packiam, is a pastor that wrote about this blessed, broken, and given. And he says this, in an age when belief is contested, when religion is a private matter with little bearing on real life, the church needs to recover the art of radical hospitality. But this is a kind of hospitality that is more than making our sacred spaces ready for others. It is the kind of hospitality that we exhibit by showing up in someone else's space with a posture of openness. You see, it's easy enough sometimes to invite people to church, but what does it look like for us to be willing to go where people are, where their needs are? Sometimes hospitality is really inconvenient, isn't it? I've had those moments where I'm like, oh, someone's coming over again, or I've got to, you know, go and love. But I think after I'm done, I never regret it, you know, getting to show hospitality to someone. We all need this reminder of who blesses us, that it's God that shows us and he's the one that speaks to us. And as we stay close to him and hear his voice, he kind of directs us. He begins to show us the people in our lives that we have. You know, sometimes we hear this and we think, oh, I've got to take on the whole world. I've already got enough on my shoulders. I don't want to add more to that. What does that look like? 
I think God's just saying, we don't have to start with the whole world, but he's saying, what's in your world? What's in the world around you, close by you? Sometimes the people that we just come across every day, people we work with, um, people we might meet up with at the gym. I think of um, parents, other parents that are sitting at your kids' sports games because there's a lot of hours spent there, right, parents? You know, and being with them or, you know, people we meet up with at the coffee shop. Gareth has actually just created a whole group of guys that see each other and, and now there's more of them come in and they come in and out of Pete's and they say hi to each other and he's gotten to pray with some of them and just encourage them. And it's just fun to see the way that we can connect to people and give of ourselves when they're with us and when they're around. Also church. Sometimes we think of church as a place that I come to receive and I might come now and then and, oh, that was a good service and I enjoyed that. But church is meant to be a place that we participate. You know, I think of our first serve that we have. I've actually seen some really cool stories of some people that have gone through first serve and really found a place to connect in here at Abundant Life. And then just a joy that they have as they get to kind of join God's mission and like get to be a part of serving and, and helping in that way. There's a lot of ways to look at at this as we give ourselves um, because of all he's done. And then the very last time we see Jesus bless, break, and give the bread away is actually right after um, he's with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. You see, Jesus just kind of joins them where they're at, just like we talked about earlier, kind of going to where they were. And these two disciples are thinking, they're so disillusioned. They're like, we thought Jesus was gonna be our Messiah. He was gonna save all the Jewish people. And so they went through that and they're just downcast. And Jesus comes along and he says, he starts to talk to them about the scriptures. He starts to show them all the prophets in the Old Testament and how Jesus was the fulfillment of those prophecies. And they don't know who he is. He's just a stranger to them. But then they come and it says in Luke 24, it says, by this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, stay with us the night since it's getting late. So he went home with them. And as they sat down to eat, he took the bread and he blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. And suddenly their eyes were open and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. And they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? I love this story of these two disciples that Jesus just came in the middle of their disillusionment and their discouragement, not knowing that, thinking it was all for nothing. Jesus is dead at this point. But I also love that in that moment as Jesus is walking with them, he kind of pretends. It says he pretends that he was walking on and they have to look and say, oh, wait, wait, come stay at our house. So they then showed hospitality. They brought in this stranger for the night to be with them. But as he comes in, usually when you're a stranger and the host of the home is gonna be the one to serve the bread to you. But Jesus actually comes in and he takes over and he actually takes the bread and he blesses it and he breaks it and he gives it. And it's in that moment that they recognize he's it. He's the savior, he's Jesus. He's the one that they thought all their hopes were dashed, but now here he is alive and risen from the dead. You know, we think sometimes when we become a Christian, we might just say a little prayer and we're like, oh, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. But just like this, this two on the road to Emmaus as they're sitting there, you know, Jesus came along and they realized as he came into their home, he actually took over. He became the host. He wasn't just the savior, he's Lord. He's Lord of our lives when we ask him to come in. And that means there's something back that I wanna give to, this, to, to Jesus, the Lord of our lives as we come. So as we make him the Lord of our lives, where there is hope, when there is despair, then we find hope, right? And where we have brokenness, Jesus comes and fills it and heals it, and then he uses it and makes it a lot more beautiful than it was even before. I love the way Jesus does this in our lives. He does this, so we do this for the love of Jesus, for the sake of other people and for the sake of the world, because God loves the world. That's his heart. And so he's asking us to join him in his mission of that, saying, I want you to be a part of serving and loving. I want you to give of yourself and live the life that I've called you to live as a Christian. We're actually gonna get ready now to take communion. So I'm gonna have the ushers come forward and start passing that out. I think about as God invites us into this life of givenness, that it all starts with who Jesus was 
And that's what communion is about. That's what that church at Carthage learned was the fact that they had Jesus first and foremost, that it allowed them, their, his love for them and their relationship with Jesus allowed them to be people that could give themselves to other people. We first also have to give our lives back to him in return. That's what he's asking for. It says in, in Romans 12, one, it says, and so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. You see, the end result is that he, and he gives himself to us, is that we can give our lives back to him and he multiplies the little we have. He takes the little, the brokenness of our lives, the incompleteness, the parts that we feel like we don't know what to give. And he says, I'm gonna use it. So I want you to hear in this moment, this isn't about, oh, I've got to look at my calendar and now I got to change all these things um, and fix it. And I got to do this, 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 and this, but it's allowing God's love, even as we take communion right now, to remember his love for us, the sacrifice that he made. He was our perfect example of this. And that then we can give our lives to the Lord. And we can say, God, even if I can't add one more thing to my calendar, but God, I can love those that you've put right in my world that I come in contact with every day. I can give myself because you've given us yourself first. We'll live a life that is a holy and living sacrifice to Jesus. This is what we're called to do. This is what it means to be a Christian and to walk with him.